All right. So thank you for uh, inviting me to to share uh, some insight on uh, how demand driven applies to the shop floor, really. And when when we enter the uh, manufacturing environment, we go beyond uh, what we've seen till now uh, about the DMRP, which is very much focused on uh, inventory management and will enter the shop floor. And when we uh, go into a manufacturing environment and enter a shop floor, usually I would encourage you to, to ask yourself uh, the next questions. Do you see the material flowing? And it's not always easy to see material flowing, particularly if you're having complex operations well, with multiple steps uh, within your uh, manufacturing environment. Do you see what, uh, what are the critical steps? What are the constraints, the bottlenecks that face your flow? Do you see easily if you're ahead or behind schedule? And, and do you see what to build next? Uh, so the whole purpose for demand-driven scheduling and execution will be to connect what we've seen earlier on, uh, which is uh, clear signals, demand, uh, actual demand-based replenishment, and translate it into visual signals uh, on the shop floor so that your operations, your manufacturing operations are fully synced with uh, the overall model. So depending on the complexity of your environment, uh, you may or may not, may not need uh, additional uh, refining on, on your scheduling practices. Uh, Typically, if you're if you're having simple operations, and I'm taking here the uh, the example of a bottling operation, it's a flow line. Uh, so you would typically just benefit from stop buffers and clear prioritization with critical, high, medium, low uh, priorities in order to schedule your production to take uh, into account your campaigns, etc. So that should be good enough just to use uh, DDMRP buffers to, to be able to drive this production properly. And you can get into some basic finite capacity uh, processes, group planning uh, to, to organize your campaigns, etc. That would work, uh, that would work fine. But when it comes to more complex environments, and this is a life example from um, a company manufacturing uh, aerospace parts. So if you have complex routings with multiple steps, with, uh, I don't know, turning, grinding, uh, uh, milling, whatever operations, uh, and some variability here and there, because uh, you can have quality issues, you can have uh, people off sick, uh, the operation didn't show up, uh, uh, etc. Uh, then it becomes way more difficult to really stick, uh, well, commit to dependable promise dates and stick to those promise dates and properly deal with the priorities on the ground, on the shop floor. Uh, the same applies if you're in a, in a mixed environment where you would manufacture some of your products to stock and therefore use uh, inventory buffers, DDMRP buffers for your make to stock flow. But as well, you have some uh, orders that are manufactured to order or even engineered to order. And how do you deal with co consistent priorities in such an environment where you have to uh, use the common resources for either make to stock or make to order uh, products that's not that simple, and that's where demand driven scheduling and execution comes into play as well. So, what are we talking about? We've been talking about sales and operations planning this morning. Sales and operations planning is uh, helping us to uh, set the right parameters for our supply chain, for our inventory buffers, etc. But then, when the DDMRP uh, order generation logic generates work orders, 
then uh, you enter this scheduling uh, step, which is basically defining uh, with finite capacity uh, process, uh, defining the due dates and when uh, each work order may run on a given operation. And then there is another layer that we'll dig into, which is how do we execute on the floor and make sure we are on time or we uh, properly prioritize the, uh, the operations. So in order to get there, we complement the inventory buffers um, that uh, alluded to earlier today, and we add two additional mechanisms. One is what we call time buffers. You can see time buffers are as being queues because in any uh, manufacturing environment, you do have queues at some steps. Uh, but in order to get uh, queues that uh, just accumulate because you're pushing material, you organize time buffers, so you organize queues and you uh, monitor their uh, status with red, yellow, green uh, positions ahead of some critical operations within your flow or just before shipping uh, the shipping point to your, to your end customers, for instance. And we also monitor capacity buffers. So we look at our resources and identify the ones that are constraints and the ones that have some slack capacity. And we monitor this slack capacity to make sure we do not have uh, moving, uh, moving constraints within uh, our operations. So what are time buffers? Time buffers will be queues. They will help uh, get the right priorities to the shop floor guys, to the operations supervisors, um, and delegate to some extent to the shop floor the uh, degree uh, of freedom on which uh, work order should we work on first. Uh, these time buffers will enable protecting uh, the critical operations within the flow, uh, make sure everyone gets a common view on priorities, and it's really a visual management tool. So we'll see that in a minute with uh, some, uh, some examples. Control points uh, will also be used in this model and control points are typically bottlenecks. For instance, if you have a constraint in your system, you want to make sure you drive your schedule based on the pace of that constraint. And there will be as well uh, the flow exit and, uh, and entry point. So when are we shipping products to our end customers, when are we uh, staging inventory in the finished goods uh, inventory uh, warehouse, or when uh, should we release work orders. We can have as well other control points within our manufacturing flow. So for instance, if, if uh, all of the uh, work orders or many work orders are going through a quality inspection step, for instance, this quality quality inspection step uh, can be as well a very good control point to monitor priorities on the shop floor. So the first thing we would do when implementing demand-driven scheduling and execution is to create a model of how the manufacturing steps take place. Uh, and this, those are some examples of the models uh, we, can, we can sketch. So we are representing the flow map of the various manufacturing operations. We are inserting inventory buffers. Those are those icons here. Uh, when it makes sense to have inventory buffers, we'll have inventory buffers uh, inserted, but sometimes you cannot just put inventory. Uh, it's really made to order products, for instance, so you will organize them buffers and we'll identify as well what are our constraints the drum here, and what are our critical control points, for instance, when I start a work order and for instance, when I ship goods to my end customer. So the first step is really to design this model. And in this model, we'll have, for instance, the drum, which is our bottleneck, the constraint. We'll have time buffers that will, so here in this example, one is protecting the drum and one is protecting the ship the shipment to end customers. And then I will have resources and then I will have 
flow profile. So we'll group uh, items depending on what their manufacturing processes are. Uh, and items that will have similar routings will be dealt with uh, in a common way. Once we define the model, so typically what we do by defining the model is really creating some kind of digital twin of the manufacturing operations. One, this model uh, has been defined, we'll schedule it. So typically here we have a drum. This drum is both replenishing some inventory, but is also uh, used to for make to order uh, manufacturings to, to fulfill sales orders. So we have signals that are replenishment signals for the inventory buffers. We have signals that are sales orders coming from uh, end customers. And what we start doing is finite capacity scheduling that run so that we generate a schedule that is uh, realistic, that we'll be able to stick to, and we level up based on the right priorities, so based on the status for the inventory buffers, red, yellow, green, based on the due dates for the end customers, we combine all that to generate a schedule uh, on the trend, and we'll commit promise dates to the customers based on that realistic schedule on the drum and based on the protections we inserted with the uh, time buffers after the drum and before shipping to the end customer. So how does it look in practice? It's a scheduling uh, workbench that will enable you to, for instance, create planning wheels, group campaigns, uh, use the right priorities, expedite some orders. Uh, so it's really a semi-automated, well, automated scheduling process, but with a human intervention possible, of course, to deal with particular situations. Once the schedule is generated, we'll release the work orders to the shop floor. So this means that the shop floor have direct, direct access to the priorities and to the work orders. And what is key in this model is that we'll use those time buffers we inserted to monitor the priorities on the ground. So typically what we have is buffer boards and those uh, are displayed on LCD screens uh, on the shop floor. Uh, in the locations where we organize time buffers. So this is, for instance, before our critical process step here. We have this buffer board. Uh, on the lower part of the buffer board, we see the work orders for which we already have everything available to run on that constraint. So basically, we know that we need to run first this work order here that is late, and then we'll uh, work the two yellow ones, etc. And on the upper portion of this board, we have the work orders that are not yet available on that process step, and that the upstream uh... Bernard, uh, you uh, turn off your microphone now. Turn it on, please. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, already. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so here we have those uh, buffer boards uh, that are displayed on the ground, and the standing meeting, the production meetings are happening before those buffer boards, and everybody has the very same understanding of what the priorities are and are we ahead. Uh, of time or uh, ahead or behind schedule, etc. So this is very visual, very uh, simple management, uh, and uh, there are a number of visual uh, visual uh, management tools that are deployed on the ground to support this uh, this approach. The next thing is that once you started and once you execute it uh, on this, so for instance, when you have a queue here, 
you will record whether your uh, work orders, your jobs are arriving in this queue uh, ahead of time, on time, or late. And depending on that, you will accumulate data uh, over time, and you will be able to use this data to collect stats. And for instance, this is a live example from, um, from an implementation. Uh, on a given time buffer here, most of the work orders were arriving early, blue, and some were arriving late. And then the, uh, this company has been able to drill down into uh, what work orders and what type of operations are arriving late and what is causing the uh, uh, so what is causing the late uh, deliveries in that buffer and reversely what what is causing those early deliveries and they were able to uh, reduce the routing uh, and get shortened the lead times on some of the items because basically they were they realized they were able to deliver faster uh, those uh, those work orders so to summarize, and that will be my uh, last uh, slide for this presentation, to summarize uh, demand-driven scheduling and execution is really the shop floor manufacturing leg for uh, the uh, DDMRP and DDOM uh, model. It uh, includes finite capacity scheduling uh, for the constraints uh, and so that you can exploit as best as possible, your constraints minimize change over times, uh, optimize the sequences, the planning wheels, etc. It's including group planning and uh, and scheduling. It enables you to commit to uh, realistic uh, due dates, realistic promise dates, with realistic uh, lead times that. Uh, are uh, consistent with your capacity and protected with time buffers from variability. It enables visual management on the shop floor and fully digitized uh, uh, pool flow uh, on the shop floor. Uh, we do not release any work orders before uh, the when it, it should be released. So we are as well controlling the working process and making sure that uh, this will enable fast uh, operations. Uh, and, and this is really consistent priorities throughout the shop floor operations for both make to order and make to stock uh, flows. So this was very brief, but I hope it was clear enough uh, for, uh, for you to understand. Any any question, Ziad, uh, at this point? Uh, yes, yes, Bernard, we have the questions. So I will briefly read on Russian, then on English. Коллеги, у нас есть вопрос аудитории. Каковы ограничения самой модели DDMRP? Не может же быть такого, чтобы ее можно было использовать везде, например, услуги, управление деньгами и так далее. Bernard, so the question is, what is the limits of the DDMRP model? This just cannot be that you could literally implement it everywhere. For example, services, the cash management, etc. Maybe some productions. What are the limits? That's uh, that's a very good question. At the very beginning, when I learned uh, the DMRP, and this was back in uh, 2014, uh, I was told uh, the DMRP applies to products that have a lot of flow. You know, that fast-moving uh, consumer goods, for instance. Uh, so products with high volume, uh, make to stock, etc. And uh, the reality is that we see over time more and more companies uh, adopting DDMRP and a full demand-driven uh, operating model, even in engineering to order complex equipment, manufacturing, etc. So this is not, you know, it, it's a framework. DDMRP and, and the demand-driven adaptive uh, enterprise model is a framework. So you need to adjust it to your own company and your own model. And that's why here you've seen the first step is really modeling. So it's key that uh, the model uh, is, uh, is in line with the reality of your company. But any company, I believe today, manufacturing and distribution company, I believe today 
uh, is able to, to benefit from the model. Yeah, uh, we got one more again, Russian English. Uh, в случае непригодности длительного годового, uh, например, планирования и переход на ситуативный анализ, каким образом осу осуществляется планирование PPR оборудования, требующее длительной uh, остановки производства и постановки комплектов запчастей. Uh, so, so, yeah, English one. In case if we have not really precise the annual planning, uh, how then we can switch to the operational analysis, uh, especially when you have the long uh, maintenance, long setup times, and you have a real long time for supplying, long uh, lead time spare parts for the equipment. How would you manage this, this one? Well, it's again, uh, it's again about uh, creating the model that uh, represents your uh, depicts your company and your constraints uh, properly. Uh, whatever your constraints are, uh, at a point in time, you need to meet the customer demand. Uh, so at a point in time, you need your model to accommodate actual orders and to uh, be able to fulfill actual orders in a, in a relevant way. Uh, so if you have long lead times, if you have changeover times and campaigns you need to run, you can uh, certainly make your model, design your model to comply and represent those constraints. But yep. what the uh, DDMRP model uh, and DDOM model is uh, urging us to do as well is to look into what are the, those constraints for and can we elevate some of them and can we build more agility in our model because eventually uh, in a never changing world we, we really need to create more agility. I don't know if I fully answered the questions yet, but uh, yeah, I think it. I think yes, I will add also a few few words for, for the um, our audience. Basically, uh, as as Bernard said, there is you have to remember that in the demand driven operating model we got stock buffers, time buffers, and capacity buffers, and basically all of them are interchangeable. So as Bernard said, all in the design, so you can design it. Probably it. Uh, thanks, uh, Bernard, for your presentation.